This is the Buffy and Lamar show. Great show. This is the Buffy and Lamar show. Great show. Thursday. This is the Buffy and Lamar show. Great, great, great show. What's happening, everybody? This is the Buffy and Lamar show. Um, all right, cool, man. So everybody kind of got a little bit uh background about uh each and, each and every person on the call today. Um so we go ahead and get into some into some of the meat and potatoes. So between the first call and this call, um I can't say that I'm surprised, but I had no idea that we would be talking about another person killed at the hands of a police officer. So like after the first call, the first call we was talking about George Floyd and in between that call and this call, which was less than two weeks ago, um, we had Rashard Brooks uh, who was killed at the hands of a police officer. Um, so today we're gonna talk about, you know, just kind of like the state of the union, um, the state of our culture, um, you know, some of the different things that's taking place worldwide uh, with the uh, recent uh, occurrences that's taking place, what's changed, what's different, like what we can do to go forward. Um, what I'm gonna say is this, um, and I'm gonna just make this statement because I kind of felt really strongly about it. Um, and then we can kind of go from there and just kind of get everybody's vibe and where they at and how they feel. So, um, about the Rashard Brooks incident. And I'll say this because this is something that I would say to every black male, young, old, um, you know, any walk of life, you know, I feel like at no point in time do we ever want to escalate a situation with a police officer. I feel like um, Rashard Brooks uh, being shot in the back uh, was definitely something that shouldn't have taken place. Um, by no means did this guy deserve to die um, at the hands of the police officer. However, um, my man Jazz put a post up on Facebook and I totally agree with the post that he was said and that what he said and I was hoping he would get on the call today. Um, but he was basically saying that we need to definitely move a lot more smart, uh, a lot smarter uh, when it comes to dealing with law enforcement. Um, if you're going to escalate a situation uh, with somebody who already doesn't have a reason to take your life, um, only thing that you're really doing is giving him more of a reason to take your life. I've been in several situations um, involving police officers, um, and I've done with you know I've I've dealt with asshole police officers, and you know I've done with I've dealt with nice police officers. Uh, me personally, uh, at no time do I want to escalate a situation with a police officer. Just out of the fact that I know how their thinking can be. You know, every time you get pulled over by an officer, it's almost like rolling the dice. You don't even know what that officer's got going on. So with respect to Rashard Brook, um, you know, I, I think that it was definitely a murder. Um, but for us, we definitely have to move smarter um, in situations like that because it's almost like the booby trap is already there. We know it's there. Don't walk right into it. You know what I'm saying? The trap is already set. So we can't afford to really walk into situations like that um, and not be smart. Um, so I just want to get some feedback on how you guys feel about it. Um, if you want to unmute your line, um, I try to want to try not to get everybody talking over each other. So uh, if anybody wants to chime in, go ahead and chime in now. I'm going to go ahead and mute, mute myself. I'll, I'll start. So I watched the video. And like you said, I was not expecting, we had our last call that we would have another death um, at the hands of a police officer. 
Now I'm going to say this. And I say, I think I said it last, last time. I believe in law enforcement. I do believe there's a culture. I do believe there's a training regimen. Um, and I do believe that for whatever reason, that our presence sometimes threatens police officers. But in that, watching the video with, with, with Mr. Brooks, I felt like the police had the responsibility to, to de-escalate the situation. The young man was not drinking and driving. Now, granted, he was parked in the driveway of the drive-through, um, but he could have easily moved, helped the gentleman move his car. And I think sometimes the police officers do not, they, they overstep the authority that's given to them. And historically, um, we've seen police officers get off. So there's not been any accountability for their actions. And because of this, I think it has fueled the ability for police officers to really abuse their power. And, you know, I, I don't think the humanity in policing is there where it used to be. I remember growing up as a kid and the police officers would help you on the side of the road. And I'm not saying they don't do that today, but they were more public servants back then. I think now with the militarization of the police and all the federal funds and uh, everything that's happened in, in, the, in the state of our union, I think it is, it has fueled this behavior. And I'll give a personal example and I'll pass the baton. So I live in a very affluent neighborhood. There's multi-million dollar homes in my neighborhood. There's tennis courts, there's uh, community pools, and I live on a golf course. And in my own neighborhood, this was last year, I was walking in my neighborhood like I always do. And the police officer stopped me. Of course, I ain't had my ID because I'm walking my neighborhood. And the police officer asked me for my ID. And immediately I got offended. And I had noticed that I had raised my tone. I probably was already irritated that day. But I caught myself because I realized I'm a black man. And so I told the officer, so I told the officer, the officer, I live in this neighborhood. I have been living here for quite some time. And uh, although I don't understand why you're asking me for my ID, I will gladly walk to my home and provide my ID if that's what you're requiring. And when he realized that he had kind of overstepped his bounds, he backed up. Now, I'm gonna say this, had I been in a, a poverty stricken neighborhood or underserved community, I do not know if it went that way. And I think a lot of times the police target, and they, they, because at the end of the day, law enforcement is a business. And there's this whole thing called this prison industrial complex. So that the, the police officers are incentivized either directly or indirectly to get so many lockups, to keep those prison beds full. And I think sometimes we either, we either cooperate with them or we don't. And so at the end of the day, that gentleman has a job. And I think sometimes we, we our response feels, fuels the, uh, the situation that's been fueled in this, this country in terms of keeping the prison industrial complex full. So I think the onus is on, it's a two-way street, but historically, no one has really, uh, no one, at least the country is at least for the first time acknowledging that there is something wrong. So I'm happy for the discussion, but I still think we have a <coughs> All right, so Kurt, let me, let me chime in one, one, one quick second before the next person goes. All right, so, um, this is a reason why I feel like it's important for everybody to know the law in their respective state, right? Um, in the state of Georgia, uh, the law, when it comes to driving under the influence, um, you can get a DUI just for being sitting in the car in the driver's seat. It says that uh, you are prohibited from operating a vehicle, a moving vehicle, or an actual physical control of the car, and that's at the discretion of the investigating police officer, right? So when you watch the video, he was falling asleep, or he was asleep at the wheel in the drive through okay, with nobody else in the car. And it's up to the investigating officer to say, all right, well, we clearly know that you was driving because you was in the driver's seat in the drive through and you were under the influence. So I understand exactly what you're saying as far as like the moral compass of policing is not there because the police officer definitely could have gave this guy a break and said, you know, you know, you, you weren't actually driving. Let me try to get you home. The moral part is there, but 
from a legal standpoint, technically he could arrest the guy, which he was getting ready to do. He was placing him under arrest because you can get a DUI from sitting in a parked car if they have, um, if they feel like you've been driving or operating the vehicle. And, you know, I was reading about it. And like I said, you got to know the laws in each of your individual states, but they go as far as to check in to see if the hood is warm, check in to see if the tires are warm to indicate whether or not you've been operating this vehicle. So I definitely agree with you as far as um, the moral part that's missing because the police department has been so militarized. Um, but at the same time, we know that, and most of us should know that. And, you know, if, if, if there's somebody who doesn't know that as a black man, I don't know what rock they've been under. Um, so to know that information that the police department is militarized and still, uh, and again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the kid should have lost his life. But what I am saying is that in certain situations, we definitely have to move a lot smarter. Because me personally, and this is my opinion, me personally, I feel like I could have walked away from that alive. You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm drunk and I'm behind the wheel, you know what I'm saying? I know that. I, I just got to take that DUI on the chin. But I get to go back home to my family and I'm still here, you know, walking the planet. Um, so, you know, to resist and to escalate the situation, I definitely think that that wasn't wise. He was drunk. He probably wasn't in his right mind. Uh, by no means did he deserve to lose his life. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm pleased that a murder charge has been brought up against this police officer. But at the same time, man, we got to move smart. We got to move smart in this thing um, because, you know, we already know, you know, we behind, we behind the ball when it comes to that. We already look, we already on the losing side when we get, when we get into a, a any type of interaction with a police officer. We already on the bad end of it before we even start the interaction. You know what I'm saying? So um, that was just all I wanted to add. Uh, who got something else? I got you, Tor. Uh, so I want to uh, kind of echo a little bit. Number one, I agree with Tor in the sense of, man, dude, you know, we, we all know dudes didn't have to die. You know what I'm saying? They, they could have done something a whole lot smarter, whether it was somebody tackle him, shoot him in the leg, he didn't have to die. My, my point that I've been vain and talking to people all week about is, like what Tori kind of said, we, we got to be smarter and we got to educate. I got three boys. So, <clears throat> and when it comes to dealing with officers, because I myself was profiled, Dude tried to snatch me out of a car up in Cobb County. My wife right there with me. And I'm like, sir, I'm not resisting arrest. I'm not resisting. I got you. But you don't have to be, you don't have to do this. And then the other cop shows up. My wife was like, do you see this? And it's the black guy that shows up. And the white guy, he was a smaller guy. But by the time we got in the car and finally got to where we was going, he apologized to me, uh, you know, because he, he, he admitted he was a little, you know, intimidated. But one thing that I knew was, okay, I'm not going to do anything to put myself in a situation to where I don't make it out of this, make it out of this thing. And with, with what happened to Rashard Brooks, like, like, like Tori said, it was terrible. You know what I'm saying? Dude, dude didn't have to die. You know what I'm saying? That him being drunk didn't warrant a death sentence. Now, even though that cop, once they did the investigations, they found out that he's had a history uh, and, and a bunch of complaints that went un, un, you know, punished or undisciplined for. So he always, he's already a guy with a chip on his shoulder. Um, but one thing that I, that I want to stress is, like Tori said, we got to educate in the sense of don't give anybody the choice to, to decide whether you whether you live or die. Because I'm like him in that sense of, okay, if I know I'm drunk, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I want to make it home to my kids. I grew up in the 90s, man. You know what I'm saying? And this, this is before cell phones and cameras, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and it was even different. 
um, for people in Los Angeles where you know cops was, was beating down brothers, you know what I'm saying? But by no means did you ever, and we knew this off our first code of the streets, I'm not about to wrestle with no cop. Nevertheless, take his take his weapon, think that I'm gonna make it alive out of that situation. You know what I'm saying? So my thing is, like what Tori said, we gotta be smarter. You know what I'm saying? Because like you said, we already got the edge against us. So I seen a video, one of our brothers sent a video, it was a white guy. So I don't remember with Jerry, with the guy named Jerry, that he was fighting with the cops. The lady cop was beating, she was busting his head and beating him, you know what I'm saying? And you can, you can see somebody in the background, they was like, Jerry, don't do this. You're going to get yourself hurt, Jerry. Stop, Jerry. <laughs> but I looked at the fact that Jerry don't get out of the car, flipped over the cop, hopped in the police car and drove off. And I was like, man, you know good. I, I was like, number one, it looked like it might have been a small town, so they probably knew Jerry like Andy knew Otis and Ernest T. You know what I'm saying? So they they knew him. I was like, but I was like, for us, you know, that that's not going to be the same. So you already know off the gate, you know what I'm saying? We already got marks against us because we black. So I, I can't be like Jerry. I ain't flipping no cop. I, I, you know what I'm saying? I ain't trying to take their take they weapons. I got to get home to my wife. So we have to be smarter, you know, in that situation. Because I'm like Tori. If that would have been me, I would have made sure I, I made it home. But yeah, I might have to spend the weekend. You know what I'm saying? In jail. And that's something I heard Keisha Lance Bottoms talk about. That maybe maybe he feared, like, felt like because it was his daughter's birthday that, that he didn't want to spend the weekend in jail. But I'd rather spend a weekend in jail than, than be gone from my from my baby's life. So, you know, my, my last thing again is just to reiterate, man, it was terrible that it happened. However, it didn't have to happen because we gotta be smart. Like, and like you said, if you've been under a rock, you know. It's already slanted. So when they pull you over and they already got their hand, you know what I'm saying, on, on that weapon, man, we got to get home. You know what I'm saying? So we don't have time to sit up there and, and try to outsmart a cop, especially in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? Where you going to run to? You can't. It ain't too many places you can run. Yeah, they could have done something different, but we got to be smarter and not – I can't give them the choice to, to, to whether I'm going to make it home or not or whether I live or die. Because I'm frustrated and I'm now I'm wrestling with them, you know. And then I so I echo that, man. We got to be smarter and we got to that's this is what we got to pass down to our boys, you know what I'm saying? Don't be in your emotions, you know what I'm saying? Because your emotions can get you caught up out here. You already know until they get until they finish all this retraining stuff that they're gonna be doing and retraining the cops on how, on how to treat people, until that happens, you got to think. Ahead of everybody, you can't think that you can do what Jerry the white man did. You know what I'm saying? Because they already shown that they not going, they not, they not letting that go. So we got to be smarter. We can't be in our emotions and do something that'll that that'll destroy our life and our family's life, man. That's that's why I'm at with. That's what's up. That's true. Hey, hey, Jerry was giving them cops that work, boy. <laughs> I don't know if y'all saw it, man. Yeah, I saw that. Man. That was ridiculous, man. Yeah, Jerry was giving them that work. And she was like, don't do it, Jerry. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Ralph, what's up? Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I want to start with, start off with this, and, and please don't get offended. But let's stop saying we, ne we need to be more smart about this. We have the talk every, every time with our kids. Now we have it with our daughters, the talk. And in most parts, we follow the instructions of the officer. As George Floyd, he followed every instruction and he ended up dead. What we need to now look at is the PTSD behind all that history Excellent. that may have manifested in Rashid Brooks, Rashad Brooks, because he probably thought, even if I cooperate, I'm not going home. So I have a better chance at surviving if I fight my way through. I mean, and this is some of the, it's the fight or flight syndrome. He fought to leave, he fought to run. That's why he fought, to run. And we gotta deal with that part of it. Because I'm gonna just be honest with you. As much as I talk to my son, as much as I talk to my daughter, as much as they follow all the rules and instructions and all of this stuff, we still looking at people dying 
after following those rules. So as a, as a group, we follow the instructions. As a group, we're the ones that teach white people, put your hands on that steering wheel. We're the one telling them this is how you function when there's a police coming, uh, uh, police lights behind you. So I, I don't think it's a problem with us as a group. Now, granted, I, I think George Floyd, be honest with you, just he, he, we saw too much death happening and he got scared. And that's what happened. And you know what? It should be room for him to be afraid and still live. <laughs> so I think what, 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 what we need to look at, because I talked to my wife about this too, because she said the same thing. And then now all of a sudden it's come out that the officers after they shot him, kicked him, stood on his shoulder, you know, all these other things to happen afterwards. So who's to say? that if he followed every instruction, after you shot him, you still doing stuff to him, that they that you would still be alive. The, the, what, we, what we need to do is look at the, P, like I said, the PTSD behind it. What is our community suffering and how can we help heal that aspect of it while we're fighting what uh, Kurt said, dealing with the police officers there and their instructions, their training, and you know what, beyond that, their pensions need to be taken Beyond that, they need to be fired. And you know what? They need to be put in jail because they broke the law. Once we start on that end and we can start dealing with the psychology of black men and women on the other end, all that other stuff will match out. Because you know what? White people need to be smarter too, but they get to live from their dumb yep. mistakes. All right, so cool, Ralph. Um, <clears throat> so we got, uh, we got, Norwood next. Before you go, I want to okay. just respond. I want to respond to Ralph real quick. Um, and I definitely think the PTSD part of it is a is definitely a real thing. Um, I looked at the video too, and I felt like you know maybe this cat, Rashard Brooks, was afraid for his life. He was afraid that his chances was going to be slim. Um, however. And this is my opinion. And again, like we don't, everybody in here is have their own opinion about the situation. They have their own way of thinking and that's okay. That's cool. But if you were to ask me, I like my chances better of not escalating a situation than I do of trying to escalate the situation. Like if I escalate a situation and I take your taser from you and I get aggressive with you, to me, that's escalating the situation, PTSD or not. You know what I'm saying? The PTSD is definitely a real thing, but uh, to me, just escalating the situation um, is not helping the situation at all. And of course, we all seen it. We all know he could have did everything right and still died. We know that. You know, that's something that's real and the PTSD part of it is real. Um, and other communities get to get away with that, uh, but we not other communities, and we, we and this is right now. And I think that in every situation, uh, you gotta you gotta look at the actual situation and what's happening in the situation. Like according to the report, he sat there and talked to the guy for 30 minutes doing the breathalyzer test. You know what I'm saying? And then when they decide to cuff him, then he want to get a he went and got you know tried to resist. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different things happening there. So, but I, I do, uh, get what you're saying, Ralph, and it's definitely PTSD from it is definitely a real thing. And even after all type of legislation is passed, the PTSD is still going to be there. It's not going to just go away overnight. Um, so Norwood, you next. Uh, Curtis, did you want to cut in real quick and say something? Just just briefly, and I want to say this, you know, in terms of the accountability, and I want to say it kind of out the rough, because here's the other thing. So outside of the compliance, there's no accountability. I'm gonna, let me talk about what accountability is. You pull Bobby over. Bobby goes to jail for whatever, DUI. Bobby's dad is calling the mayor. Bobby's dad's calling somebody on city council. So even though Bobby did wrong, because Bobby's dad is connected, Bobby's dad was able to get his 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 sentence removed. And that's sometimes that we don't have as a community. So like, for example, I had a run in with the law 
about three years ago. I got pulled over because of South Carolina made a mistake and my license was suspended. So I was in Georgia. I, I was driving my father's car. He had a bus to tell like, I got pulled over. I was in the back of a squad car. I ain't fussed with the officer. Went on, took my sentencing, bailed myself out, got out of jail about three hours later. And as soon as I got out, I called my senator and said, hey, this is what, this is what happened. That 24 hours later, not only did I get my bail money back, but my, everything was wiped off my record. So I think sometimes we just don't know how to utilize the system. And because people who normally don't look like us do, the cop has to think twice. Because when they pull their, those guys over, they don't know who they know. But most of the time, we don't have the capital. We don't have the money. If we go to jail, we, ain't got, we don't have the money to get out. And if we do get out, we don't know how we go and pay our fine and just confide. But until we start using the system that will work for anybody, and we start understanding who our elected officials are and start pulling and it. And it, doesn't, it wasn't just because I knew my elected officials. Anybody can call down to their, um, to their senator's office or the House of Representatives office. You just got to know who's called. And I think sometimes it's more ignorance than anything that, that finds us in a bad spot. Dope. Cool. Um, Nor would you up? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm keep it keep it very brief. But the first thing I want to say in, in response to the concept of move smarter and know your laws. Um, uh, my brother already responded to say you can still get killed because at the end of the day, when I hear that, all of that just sounds like trauma to me, right? White people don't have to worry about that. That's something black people have to live and carry and talk about and pass on through generation to generation. So I really believe. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So even that small microaggression is an injustice. So as a result, that even though you are right, we do have to live. The fact that Rayshawn Brooks was alcohol in the system, we already know his decision making was impaired, right? Fight or flight kicked in. My man could have got an Uber. He could have got a million other different ways. So as a result, I'm somebody who really believes in defunding the police in a major, major way. Because Black people and Black and Brown communities have larger inner with police than any other communities. And as a as the people that we're electing into office, they keep funding budgets that put money into their pockets in an exponential rate. Now, I do believe in order, I do believe in strategy, I do believe in the community coming together, but I don't necessarily believe in an oppressive police force existing in our communities in any shape or form. So I mean, that, that's just like a little brief, but that, I mean, my whole point was just to say like, yo, it's, it's trauma that we got to attack and we got to deal with. And um, the, the police need to be defunded because at the end of the day, they're just the evolution of slave catchers back in the 1800s. There is a tradition that is built on it. There are a lot of stripes and, and, and badges and a lot of immigrants did come in and join it. So you have a lot of Irish and Italian people that really believe that their people are a part of this police union and that's fine. But from eight, the 1800s, it was slave catchers and that's what they've been and have evolved into just catching black bodies. Cool, cool. That's a great point. Um, Definitely a great point. Uh, D, what's up, man? You next? Yeah, I, I um, I don't know if it's just because I have where I come from or military background or whatever, but I I absolutely hear what everybody's saying as far as um the escalation. I I agree with the escalating the situation all day long. One thing I do understand is that like. Me, myself, personally, I have an extremely calm demeanor. So it's easy for me to talk to just about anybody, right? One of the things that I do understand is that everybody's not me, right? Everybody doesn't think the same way, doesn't react the same way. Um, and I also think that considering the climate that we're in, it's going to heighten everybody's everything, right? The cops are going to see themselves in a situation where say you know 10 videos ago they probably wouldn't have felt the same way as they do 10 videos later you know what i'm saying after seeing a lot of this stuff going on after seeing um how they're being handled how the community is 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 rising up against them so to speak however you want to look at it um people in just just black men in general after you see five or six, seven, 10, 20 people get shot on camera and watch the cops get off. You couldn't normally, in a normal situation, you might be somebody that's, that's normally calm and cool and keeps their head, keeps their wit about things. 
um, you know, remembers that, remembers their laws, remembers how to handle the situation, you know, but because of the climate, because of what's going on, they might freak out and just get scared. You know what I'm saying? Um, and we've seen it time and time again. One of the things that I, that I do, that I don't hear a lot of when I hear people having these conversations is I don't hear anybody, uh, I've been listening to a lot of, uh, my man's name is um, Colian. So forgive me if y'all if y'all not paying attention to him, whatever. The brother's a he's a he's a uh, he's a gun owner. He's a spokesman for the NRA. He is a attorney, a black attorney. Young brother. Uh, if you don't know him, look him up. He's uh, and he speaks to the Second Amendment about us, uh, you know, the right to bear arms. And I just like wholeheartedly believe in you know, the first first rule of the law of nature is survival, period, first and foremost. So however you survive the confrontation, the situation, you know, if you find yourself in that situation, um, if you can survive that confrontation or you can survive that, that situation by way of just, yes, sir, no, sir, speaking to the individual, and that works, and cool. But if it takes for you to survive, if it takes for you to raise arms against that person, whether he be a law enforcement or not, you going for your life, survive the situation. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's a whole lot better for everybody to know. Like I teach, I talk to my sons about how to, how, you know, how to uh, speak to people, not even just police officers, but just in general, just how to speak to authority, how to speak to other men. When you meet them, you automatically give people respect unless they give you a reason not to. You know what I'm saying? If I meet somebody, First time I ever meet you, I'm gonna shake your hand strong. I'm looking in the face. I'm gonna say, "Man, how you doing? It's good to meet you. Great to." I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that you are just as respectful of a brother as I am until you give me a reason not to. In the moment that I feel like, okay, I gotta handle this person a different kind of way, then I'm either gonna back up or just say, "Let me fall back." But if I can't back up and you back me into the corner, then I'm gonna, you gotta do what you gotta do to survive the situation. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think that's I think that's a really important point that a lot of a lot of us, you know, when I hear, and I'm not just talking about us right here in the Zoom room, but I'm just saying a lot of the, a lot of the um, talks that I hear online, people, you know, having these conversations. I don't hear so much people teaching, talking how to, you know, self defense class, talking gun ownership, talking like, you know, listen, if all else fails, you need to survive that situation. You need to come out of that situation alive period, point blank, because you can do all of the right things and get killed. You cannot do the right things and get killed. But the possibility of you getting killed is a real possibility. It's a real possibility. And it's, it's just a fact. Like if you, if you, like you said, if you've been up under a rock, you know, you might, you might not realize it, but it's a real thing going on. Um, four, four people, five people have been hanged since May. Five people have been yeah, hanged. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. In a tree since may this is 2020 yeah two out right? here in la this is 2020 and five hangings since may and this is we're not even in july yet I, I think that's crazy crazy so what do you do when you you know what you do when you got a you got a son a nephew a cousin a brother that's like i mean i, I think it's i, I think it would be really unwise to just teach you know Hands up, put your hands on a beat. Be, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm not saying don't don't tell them that. But I'm also saying if you find yourself in a situation and you're fearing for your life, also practice how to survive that situation and how to get home. Right. Um, all my time in the military, all my time driving trucks, all my time just growing up in the hood, you know, going in the streets or whatever. My main thing was make it home. There were some times that you might live on a certain block. You got to go through a certain cut. You got to take a certain route to get to the house. You got to survive that. You got to survive that, 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 you know, that route, you know what I'm saying? And if you got to, if you live on the East side and you got to go through Thornton Park, you know what I mean? And you got, or you got to, or you got to get, get through the bricks or through uh, Pioneer Homes or something like that. And you got to make that transition. You're going to have to survive that, that route. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's going to be some obstacles along the way. You might be able to talk your way out of it and you might have to, you might have yeah. to, uh, God, go God, that way. It is what it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's I think hey. I think just as important as it is to teach 
and practice and preach peaceful protests, you know, do everything the right way, the law, et cetera, it's also important to understand that this is not, we didn't create these laws. We didn't write these, we didn't write that constitution. We didn't write these laws. We didn't put, we didn't create these police. This is not our thing. So it's important, just as important as it is to, okay, look, do the right thing. Don't give them a reason. If you find yourself in a situation, survive the situation and make it home. Right. And, if you, and if it means you got to put your hands up or if it means you got to swing or if it means you got to run, grab the car, whatever you got to do to survive, just survive. And that's all I'm, that's all I'm saying. Right. Cool. That's a good point, um, D. Uh, Kay, I'm coming to you next. I just want to say, um, just for me personally, moving to the South really opened my eyes when it comes to, when it comes to the Second Amendment rights. Um, I don't know. I know the state. Uh, I know the laws in New York State, and I know the laws in Georgia. Um, I don't know the laws in L.A. or in the D.M.V. area. Uh, I'm going to speak for myself. Um, I would encourage anybody to do what's necessary, like like Dewan said, to protect themselves, um, because um, our counterparts are ready. And I've seen it firsthand. Um, they, when it comes to, and that's why they're so um, adamant about supporting the NRA. Um, they are adamant and they locked and loaded and ready for pretty much anything. Um, so when it comes to, you know, just being wise and strong and protecting our families, you know, if anything was to happen, uh, because, uh, every 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 you know, when it comes to police officers and when it comes to just regular civilians, um, everybody doesn't want to coexist with us, um, and that's just a fact. You know, you got extremists and other type of people um, who have no desire at all to hear what we say. They don't care about Black Lives Matter. I pulled up to the restaurant this morning and pulled up to a bumper sticker that said, police lives matter. Um, and I, I see it all the time. Uh, so there's a group of people that could care less about this movement. Um, so I would do is encourage people to, you know, everybody, man, protect yourself. You know, I don't know what, what everybody's view is on uh, the second amendment and the right to bear arms, but you gotta, you gotta kind of think about it. Like um, Dewan said, man, survival and if it's brought to your doorstep what you're going to do you know be prepared and be ready um so that's just my point of view uh k what's up all right so um my pro my approach is a whole lot different and um i ask for discernment on on this right here because what i believe is this okay i think all lives matters of course the cops have a job to do themselves, right? They're nervous, they're scared, they're really fearful of us as black people. I don't understand why we're not talking about group ec economics, because to me, I think it still boils down to the dollar bill. Bottom line, I think when it gets down to it, if we, ch if we change our tax bracket, we won't have these conversations, we won't have these problems. You know, um, I think ignorance is a part of it um, when we talk about we don't understand how to pool our resources together and that all politics is local you know what i'm saying if we trying to make some changes we got to start on a local level you understand these things that we're talking about will never change unless we're in a in a position where they respect us they don't respect us because we're not there's no contribution that we're adding to this thing the patels um these people from china um they come over here and they surpass us with their dollars so they get a little more respect. They can live in better communities. Their tax bracket is changed because they're able to circumvent that money. They look at us and they think they look at us as, as the weaker vessel. So they don't, they don't they don't respect us. So to me, my whole thing is, is strictly economics. And mind you, I've been in situations where I got pulled over a bunch of times. And you know what? I was able to talk myself out of those situations a bunch of times and don't even get, I mean, walk away with a warning. Okay, but all, that also says a lot to the, the, the steps that I took 
to try to make sure that I'm in a certain area. I listen, listen, I live in an area where cops still patrol, make sure that my community is safe and all that stuff. And I like that because it made my property value go up. You know what I'm saying? So there's, listen, there's pros and cons. Cops don't get paid a lot of money. 35,000, 40 grand a year to, to, to put your life on the line. It's not a lot. I am not saying that all the death and all the things that we've been through is something that should not happen. Bottom line, it shouldn't happen. Okay, we're always going to be profiled. But I also believe that if we put up, I mean, listen, I'd rather be profiled in a situation where I know when they pull me over, they'll say, okay, we're just making sure that you're okay and keep it moving. You know, nothing more than, you know, you ain't got to pull me out of the car. You don't have to want to search my car. You don't have to want to, if you're in a beaten up Chevy, okay, broken down, your, 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 your tail light is hanging off, one tail light not working, they're going to pull you over. They're gonna they're gonna run your license. They're gonna make it's all it's all circumstantial, so it just depends. So yes, we have to be smart, but I also believe that if we change the the economics of it, it makes a big difference. Everybody that's on this call today, if we're talking about group economics and we pool our resources, we 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 buy things that we can invest in together, right? We're all making a certain amount of money where we can change. The dynamic, the dynamic of a conversation where our kids don't have to worry about none of that stuff. Then it's a whole different situation. The cops would have to respect us. If we spend with, if we spend black, which I know can be hard sometimes because we don't, we, I mean, how much do we really control? You know, but this is the conversation we're having right now. Let's see how much we can control. I think that's more the big the narrative for me. I get what we're saying about the brutality and all. I get it. All after all these destroying properties and all that stuff that's going on then what okay i mean what a, a month from now two months from now we don't forget about it it's, it's, it's life as normal as normal as usual and 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 what have we really achieved did we really i saw something out there where there's a group of people that bought a whole town black people i think for like 1.7 something million dollars right to me that was great to me that's a start that's kind of what we need to do we need to really pool our resources. We need to control the, the local elections. One of the things that Curtis said was capital. Okay, I wrote it down. Elected official, I wrote it down. Okay, intentions, responsibility. We have to take responsibility for those things so that we can propel ourselves to be in a position where when they pull us over, okay, Dave Chappelle got pulled over the other day. And don't you know the same cop that pulled him over end up killing one of these guys that we're marching for right now? The same cop. The only reason why he was able to let Dave Chappelle go is because when they pulled him over, they saw that he was Dave Chappelle. They was like, oh, we know who you are. He got a pass. Because he's, because he's, of course, he's a celebrity. I get it. But what I'm saying, if we work on changing some of the things where we're controlling a little bit more, where we have a little bit more access. Okay, same thing that Curtis said. When he got pulled up, he had access. He was able to reach out to certain people and get things to work in his favor. We need to build those kind of relationships so that we don't have the same problems. Okay, we need to be almost on the same level. I, I mean, yeah, they got a 400-year start on us, but we have to stop being consumers and figure out a way to build our communities with our economic dollars. That's how I see it. The only way these folks don't get it is unless we, we pull our money. We have to pull our money. Cool. That's a good point, Kay. Um, D, I'm going to come to you real quick, and then Ralph. D, you wanted to respond to that real quick, and then uh, we're going to go to Ralph after that. Yeah, yeah, Kay, I, I, I definitely feel you on the economic um, tip, my brother. Um, like I said earlier, and I, and I believe um, there was one of the other cats, too, was talk, we talk about uh, uh, Forex trading. Um, one of the, my two biggest points, because I, I have this, uh, we have these conversations with my trading group all the time, and uh, conversations just like this and my, my two get biggest points that I've narrowed it down to is number one is is economics and number two is safety and security right so and and you can go all the way back to any time uh, sovereign country or, or or a country in power European country or whatever where they want to they want to take over overthrow whatever you want to call it right it's two things is either either or they they usually they want to take over their resources right they want to it's something that it's in that space of that town or whatever that they want and they want to take it so they try to create some type of a law or whatever that gives them the right and if you don't abide by it then they just take it by force right so the the two things that i always think about is economics because we obviously we're i think everybody knows that we're 
that we're outmatched economically when it comes to um, no land, wealth, et cetera. So my, one of my main things is, I mean, that's, that's what I trade for, is to create, is generate, create wealth and the freedom to not have to be, you know, to not have to live in those type of communities that are targeted. Now, that being said, um, you still have situations like where LeBron James's house got sprayed, sprayed up with the N-word all over his house. You still have situations where the brother that was a, a I think he was an FBI agent or something like that, and they, and they, uh, you know, they pulled him, they pulled him up, put the handcuffs on him, and said he looked like somebody that they thought he matched a, a description or something like that. Until after they pulled his wallet out and found out he was an FBI agent, you still have situations where. Uh, I was looking at the other the, the, the other day. I was looking at Donald McNabb um, video where he had got his DUI. But there's 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 always and like you said, you mentioned David Chappelle also. There's always situations where even people that have reached certain certain levels of plateaus of economics still get harassed and 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 maybe even more so because the whoever the arresting police officer is or whoever the, the um, investigating officer is might just like the fact that they don't might just dislike the fact that they have more money than them or they're on a different place than them so they just feel like i'm a i'm gonna be i'm in a place of power so i'm just gonna harass this guy because i know he's a millionaire but i got a badge on so i'm just gonna give him a hard time because i can right um i definitely think economics is super important like for me that's like number one on my list actually but right after that um and I, I'm not even gonna say right after that, but on the, on the other side to that, to me is, is is safety and security. Now, there's a lot of pieces that I think we need. Like I think we absolutely need peace protests. I think we need uh, politics. I think it's huge. I think we need religion. I think we need all of those things. I just choose to, I choose to focus on economics, safety, and security because you can. Li- I live in Gwinnett, right? If you look at the stats for, I was on I was online the other day looking at. Syracuse, New York, looking at the crime rate. Uh, one of, a friend of mine uh, called me up and said, man, have you seen, there's a, they, got a, they got a list out of um, sexual predators, right? The predator list or whatever is in Syracuse. And we, was, we were having a conversation about that. She was like, you should look on there. And I looked on there and I actually saw probably like six people that I knew personally, right? When I was younger, I was just like, wow, right? So I'm, I'm just sitting here looking at it. And then I, and then after that, I just looked at crime in general, murder, looked at, you looked at violent crimes with guns, drugs, it, it has a list of all of them. And when I compared Syracuse to Gwinnett, it's like, literally, it is night and day. And I tell my kids, I tell my sons all the time, the reason why you grew up in Gwinnett, the reason why you was born and raised in Gwinnett and grew up in Atlanta, this is why. You know what I'm saying? Because I grew up in, I grew up in, 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 on the west side of Syracuse in the projects. If you look at Syracuse today, and you look at Gwinnett today, we probably, Syracuse probably got us beat 600%, right? Like, I'm not even exaggerating. And violent crimes, murders, all these other things. is also a huge difference, right, between the, the gap of, the gap of wealth of colored people versus white people from Syracuse to Atlanta. And I think um, most people know that. Um, so, you know, for that reason, early on when I was, uh, I think I was probably 17 when I first came to Atlanta, we used to hear stories about it. Like, you know, it's the black Mecca. It's the, it's the place where dreams are made or to come true for black people, for black men. Right. So you hear the stories about Martin Luther King and, and, um, all the marches and stuff that happened here in in Atlanta. And then it just kind of like in the early nineties, it exploded. I was heavy in the music. So the face was down here. They was doing big things and it just Jermaine Dupree and it just kind of took off. Like Atlanta just kind of took off from there. Even to this day, you got Tyler Perry. I mean, I can, I can name a bunch of different reasons, a bunch of different um, examples of, of black wealth in Atlanta, quote unquote wealth in Atlanta. So it, it looks great. And it's definitely something that I said, you know what, that's more imp- probably more important than anything is, is, is I need to obtain some wealth or either start on that wealth path so that not even for me, but my sons, my grandsons, my great grandsons, four generations from now, they won't be live. They won't live in impoverished communities where gentrification is going on and all this other kind of stuff, and they can't afford it. So they're forced to live in situations that are probably going to force them to make decisions that they don't want to make. That's going to cause them to be in in places that they don't want to be in, i.e., in front of police officers, in prison, 
you know, looking looking down a barrel of a gun, et cetera, right? But the other part of that that I think is really important is I, I still think security is almost just as important as that because I think we are at wartime, wartime right now. And if the other side is at war, they obviously don't want to give up their power. And the people that, even if they don't have a lot of economics, like I said, the cops and stuff like that, they just got a badge and they feel like they have some power and they want to use it or they want to take what you have and they feel like they can and they got a law or they have a badge, they got something that makes them feel like they are enabled to take that by force, then you still have to be prepared for that also. Because you could live in, like the, like, uh, like the other, like uh, Curtis said, you can live in a golf course community. They probably hardly ever see situations like that, but he's still, he still got pulled over, he still got harassed, right? In his own community. He probably never thought it would happen, but it still happened. So he, he was still, it was still important for him to, to know what to do in that situation. It was still important for him to know how to handle himself. And I think even more so, had he did everything right, and that cop still decided to say, you know what? I'm just gonna slam your face in the car, turn you around, put the cuffs on you just because I can, and say, oops, you know what, sir, sir I'm sorry. I thought you was somebody else, but just, just to rough him up, just to get him irate, just to see how he would react, just to see if he would. And I still think it's just as important in a situation like that, not only to have the economics behind you and have the know-how and have the, the nicer car and live in a nicer neighborhood, you know, and have the wealth and not have to worry about those communities, but still survive the situation. Um, and yeah, that's all, that's all I really want to say. I know that, uh, I know that that's a, uh, economics is a big piece. We don't talk about that as much either as black men, I don't think as much as we need to. And we definitely need to be teaching our kids that. Um, but I just didn't, I just didn't want anybody to miss that piece because it's not only about, you could have, you have a billion dollar home, be black and still get shot and get hung by a tree by somebody that just, they just don't care. They just don't like you or they just don't like the fact that you got that house. I don't know if you ever seen, uh, I, I know you've probably seen Harlem Nights. It, it just reminds me of Harlem Nights when a dude was just like, you know, he looked, he, he went to go see Sugar Ray and Sugar Ray's living in this nice ass house and he got the suit, you know, he got the clothes. He's like, that's a nice suit. You living over here comfortable and I'm in a fucking hubble. You know what I'm saying? And he's yeah. a cop. So he just like, I'm just going to come over here and just give you a hard time because I just don't like seeing black men thrive. Period. Giving them a hard time just because. Just giving them a hard time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And, and listen. That's a look, good point. I, let, let me just chime in real quick. I, I understand all that. I mean, <laughs> I understand all that. But all I'm saying is that if there's enough of us in those positions, it becomes lesser. That's all I'm saying. If there's enough of us that's controlling the narrative, it becomes lesser. Yes, they're going right. to always hate us. You're right. You know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. But if we're teaching right. our kids and our generation behind us and they're controlling the narrative, at some point we can, we can, we can employ our own police forces. That's all right. I'm saying. You're right. We You're just right. got to pull yeah. our resources together and know that we're strong enough to do that. That's all Absolutely. I'm saying. Look, Absolutely. We gonna have yeah. racism. Racism been around for the longest. You know what I'm saying? I don't love them crackers. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I work with them. And you know, and the funny thing about it is that I've actually even had got more opportunities from some white folks than my own Negroes. I don't right. have Negroes that shit it on. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting too passionate. <laughs> I've had some black folks that crapped on me. You get what I'm saying? Over some right. old petty stuff. You know what 100%. I'm saying? Small stuff. 100%. You understand? Where white people sometimes don't even look at that stuff. They're looking at what you're going to do for me and how we can genuinely make some bread together. And you if you're genuine. Don't get me wrong. So you're going to have racism across the board. Okay, right. all I'm talking about is building our own capital, pulling our resources together, changing our zip codes, making sure that our kids understand what it is to invest early, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about as early as 12 or 13, as soon as they can understand to do a little bit of math, okay? Understanding that the market has always been able to present profits year over year, whether it be 8, 10, 15%, depending on what you invested in, you know, so that their kids can have a, have a shot at, at being successful. That's all I'm saying. Then once we right. do these things, then we can, we can look at the elected officials, okay? We can look at we, our, our ability to be able to go in and make transformative changes as far as on the local level will kind of work work itself out that's all i'm saying and 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 Whoa. we can talk about it as much as we can talk about the police brutality and like we and it's all conversation i get it but until we intentionally decide that listen we're going to do something about it we're still just talking i what agree are we doing? I, I agree 100 hey, percent. let me I gotta, uh I gotta, 
I got a ten and eleven year old daughter that know how to trade, so I feel you. Yeah, let me go to uh, let me go to Ralph. Ralph, we've been waiting, man. Go ahead. What you got, Ralph? Yeah, um, I, I don't want to. I, I like what you said, Kay, in, in regards to uh, finances, and but but again, <laughs> even with finances, security, all that, uh, it's not a like you said, it's not a either or. It's a both and. In the sense, it's and, and even what uh, Kurt said, making sure that we have the political structure as, as an arm. We got to do it systematically because I'm going to tell you, fine, uh, being wealthy, even as a group, is not enough. We can be all millionaires. It won't be enough. You know why I know? Right. Black Wall Street. Yep. All right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, they just burnt it down. Exactly. We, we, exactly. Can, be armed, look, we can be armed up to the T. Armed. And it won't matter. I know Black Panthers in the 1960s. They got rid of them. Facts. These Facts. Are the, you got to do it all. We can't just do pieces. We got to do it all. And we can do it all gener gradually and generally at the same time. And, we, and the key is, if you're going to change government structure, you got to put your people in place, which means but rather Black or white, if they have your agenda and we decide that agenda and we finance that that person that's going for that office and we put them there, then we can determine what laws are passed, how the police are hired, all that. We can determine all that, but we got to do all of it. Yeah, we got to be armed. Yes, we got to have the, the money to do it, but it's got to be for a purpose. It can't just be that I got me and mine. I got me and mine, I'm good. No, it's got to be us and ours. All right, now let's put the political structure in place. And then while we have all those things in place, not only locally, not only statewide, but federally. So when it, another Black Wall Street can't happen. Why? Because you got people in place that say, no, that's not allowed. We won't allow that. We'll, we got to put our those pieces in place, but we got to do it strategically and we got to do it wisely. If we focus only on one thing, we're going to end up like history. 100%. Okay, so, 100%. so this, is, this is why I said group economics in the first place, right? Because that's, that's, that's the most important piece. Group economics. So we can do all, everything that you're saying, Raphael, I'm 100%. I'm that's pretty much, you, we, you're saying the same thing I'm saying. Okay, all I am saying though is that if we're going to do that, we have to have a meeting where it's 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 almost like the, the creature of Jekyll Island. I, I don't know if anybody read that book or understand where that came from, but that's J.P. Morgan, all the big banks, okay, mm -hmm. met here in Georgia, okay, and did a whole big deal where they, they run the financial institute, okay? We can do the same thing. We just, got, we just have to be to the point where we don't tell everybody about it. That's our biggest problem. We talk too damn much, okay? We need to get together. A group of people need to get together, put plans structures in place where we slowly buy back our community okay we can yes. get our own police force we can get a week of people in place where it allow us to to achieve the greater amount of success over time right it ain't gonna right. happen overnight over fast, time gonna, you do it too fast they're gonna they're gonna wipe you out they're gonna they're gonna know exactly <laughs> so all i'm out. saying is that yeah, they, 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 they're gonna keep killing us if we don't have nothing if we don't if they, if they don't see if they see us less than a man they don't, they don't respect us. The only thing these people respect is the, the, the dollar. And it's sad to say that. Well, they won't respect your dollar if they think they can take it. And that's the problem. Exactly. They think they can take it. So what you got to do is put safeguards around, because we can do group economics, but they'll, like, they killed 3,000 people and had the government assist them. So that means you got to have people in government protecting your interests, just like the Facts. Jews do, Facts. just like everybody else do. Facts. You go. Facts. And I don't think they really respect the dollar because look at how they just keep printing money like it's nothing. I don't think they have respect for money. I do understand what you're saying about group economics, and I do stand by that. But also money by itself is Yeah, well, 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 they, have, they yeah. don't have a choice. They don't have a choice at this point as far as printing the dollars because right now, they have to try to prop the economy, economy up as much as possible. So they're going to keep printing printing money. But the goal is this, do now. While they're printing money, they're, expect, they're expecting us to go out there and spend that money to stimulate the economy. Okay, because they know black folks, we're going to shake our butts. Okay, we're going to go to the club. We're going to go to all the spots and, and put that money right back in their pockets. So all the money that they're trying to give us is all they print money for us. Okay, right. so we can hey. go back out and spend that money right back and give the money right back to them and stimulate the economy when we should be smart enough to say, okay, 
I might spend some money, but let me put some money aside so I can I can buy this infrastructure. I can buy this. I can invest in this. I can buy some stocks. I can, you know what I'm saying? So that when it's hey. all said and done, when when there's a recovery, we sitting pretty. We sitting on a couple, you know what I'm saying? Hundred, two, 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 three hundred thousand, whatever. We can make some other moves. So let me let me let me chime in on that real quick, and then I'm gonna go to tone. Um, so uh, the economics part of it is definitely a big part of it. I totally agree with that. Um, I think the challenge in the economic part is, you know, when you start to talk about ownership and, you know, getting in positions of power, the problem and the challenge there is that we actually have to get into those positions of power, right? You can, you could try to buy all of the properties and things of that nature. Uh, you can try to buy them, but who's to say that they're going to sell them to you? You know what I'm saying? I've seen quite a few situations where we got the money. Uh, to buy certain things, but because of the people that already have the power, you, you know, you can't get into certain groups or can't get into certain situations. Um, so it's definitely a challenge in that. You know, we can definitely create our own, uh, but also to remember that, remember where we are. Like so, so, instance, so Tori, Tori, I'm gonna chime in. I'm gonna chime in one minute here, Tori. I remember Cory Booker just had a whole conversation about that the other day, and he was saying that his dad back in the days when when racism was at, at its peak right his dad and his mom and they had the money to do it wanted to buy a crib and they kept getting denied and kept getting denied so eventually they fought they fought they found a white couple to go in as a representative for them right to go in and buy the crib they probably even got a better interest rate and everything right and they used that white couple to go in bought the crib when it was when it was time for the signing it was them that showed up for the signing you get what I'm saying? What I am saying, and, and what I'm saying is that, so now we have to be strategic. That's all I'm saying. And yeah, you yeah, right. We, yeah. might, we might be denied on certain levels, but okay, let's pull back and figure out, okay, okay let's say all of us on right now decided we want to buy a, a apartment building, okay? And we know they're going to deny us. I guarantee you we could find somebody who, who don't look like us, shoot them a little something if we have to. I'm just, I'm, I'm just talking about plain old strategy. Right now we got to just think, Gorilla so I think tactics. outside the box. Yeah, yeah that's, what the, uh, outside the box. that's what the, uh, I don't know if y'all seen that movie. What's the movie? The Banker? The Banker. Uh, yeah, if y'all saw The Banker, man, if you haven't seen The Banker yet, make sure you watch it and check it out. It's a real good movie. Um, good point, Kay. Uh, Tone, where you at? Going to you next. Yo, yo, what's up, fellas? What up, Tone? What up? First of all, ap apologies for my tardiness. Um, yeah, I think a lot of great things were said by everybody on the call. Um, what I will say initially is uh, on the point of economics, you know, that's, that's a, it's a necessity for sure. But I think we get lost on the point of trying to play their game, essentially. Because at the end of the day, we perpetuate the crab and the bro mentality just on a grander level. So we have a few uh individuals of color who reach the top quote unquote but then there's a lot of those people who want to play up to that agenda because they want to stay in the good graces of you know said multi-millionaire or billionaire i'm sure we've all been in rooms where we had to talk to extremely wealthy white men and i think the issue is the fact that we're sitting here trying to come up with schemes and plans and like and alternate tricks to get ahead as opposed to focusing on the root issue, which is as people who are just in search of equality, not combat, not any type of war, we've been fighting all this time for equality. We shouldn't have to even think in those terms. We shouldn't have to think, oh, how, how do I find a loophole or what's, where's my way into this and teaching that to our people because that's not what this whole thing is about. That's the thinking of the old world. And we've all had to move that way to get to the points that we are within our respective careers. But like Ralph said, you can build up the greatest economic structure ever in black history. Hate is still going to be at the core of it for them. It doesn't matter what your status is. If you get caught, if the KKK catches you, they're not checking status before they hang you. It's not happening. And, and I think that KBiz made a lot of incredible points, but I think to solely focus on economics and expect that to bring the balance into the situation, it's not what it's really about. They'll let a few of us in the door for sure, but we have to get to a point where we're demanding and asking for 
equality on a real level if we're going okay. to do this here. All right, so hey, let me so chime let me, in again. Let me, let me try, let me, let me, let me, let me respond to that real quick. Um, so I think that, um, the reason why, you know, it's almost necessary for us to play the game right now is because of where we are. We in America, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is not a land that was made for us. You know, we not supposed to be here, uh, at least in a, at least in a, uh, uh, in a, a place of freedom or, you know, have the rights and stuff like that, that we've gained over the years, you know, that wasn't the plan for us. Um, so playing the game and being strategic <clears throat> and building the economics, um, all of that is part of just the fact that we're in America. So th right now, the powers that be is not us. Uh, so we have to strategize in order to try to uh, somehow put ourselves in position um, to actually do some damage and 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 because you got to figure you got to look at it like this and you know we have the debate all the time about President Obama right Kurt posted about it the other day about President Obama and they gave him a bunch of shit for that boy. <laughs> Kurt posted about President Obama the other day. Ralph was one of them. Ralph gave him hell about President, about President Obama the other day. And the thing about it is uh, the presidency is the most powerful position in the land, right? You had a black man in the most powerful, powerful position in the land. Yet there were people that expected him to do all of these great things for black people. Um, and he wasn't really um, allowed to do that, uh, even though he was in that position. Um, so that just goes to the point to say that uh, we could be economically great. You know, we can hold the most powerful position in the land. Uh, we can have all of these things working for us. But like Ralph was saying, like somebody else was saying, if all things aren't working together, you know, because we're in America, it's, it's challenging to even change just some of the smallest things. You know, if you are, if you kind of, if you kind of pay attention to what's happening right now, these things we've been crying and, 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 and protesting about, we've been protesting about the same thing for the longest, right? For years and years and years, but no traction starts to get made until white people actually jump in on it and say, all right, well, we need to actually try to do some of this stuff uh, that they've been yeah, that, uh, that's, asking that's, for us to do. That's true, but I, I don't think that'll stop them. A great business opportunity won't stop the other side from murdering people senselessly. Like, I don't, I don't think that's the end goal. Like, I don't think that should be what we're hanging our hats on is what I'm saying. Of course, and in the moment, whoever has the power is who we need to be in the good graces of to get ahead as far as business is concerned. But a um, multi-millionaire, billionaire, black individual could get pulled over, as I believe DeWan said, and still be murdered. So I think like, hey, like sitting on the economics talk is cool, but it, because it's a, it's a grand part of us moving ahead, but that doesn't negate the fact that nothing had, no status, no amount of money, no position is gonna change how people feel because not everybody is in a position of wealth, so it can be driven by that. There can be extremely wealthy individuals that still think your life. You could, you could break bread with a Caucasian individual, and in the back of his mind, he could still be thinking you're a worthless nigga. And that's, the, that's my whole point. So we can't, that can't be the selling point at all, but it's a, it's a vital piece of us building up as a black community, because if people are calling for defunding the police and abolishing the police, what they need to be prepared for is that because we don't have that protection, you have these closeted racist cops now able to live their truth because they don't have to police your area anymore. So we need to also have the conversation about weaponizing within our own communities because that's what happens next. You can defund or abolish oh, the police, exactly. but if you don't have that protection, all hell is gonna break loose. Facts. Because we're not prepared and we're talking about Damn. how to get in their good graces. We need to talk about how to, to level up and equalize the playing fields across the board. So funding needs to stay within the black community. So those individuals 
who are in a position and do have money, we, we shouldn't be moving with the mindset of trying to get in the good graces of the quote unquote obvious enemy at this point. We need to be taking that, that money and funding and educating these individuals. You can't get upset at individuals within our race who aren't educated and don't and aren't privy to the conversation that we're privy to. Because that's systemic. That's not nobody wakes up or nobody's born into this world and has a desire to be ignorant. It's impossible. Because you you just don't know it. It's systemic. So where they place us at, where most of us come from, poverty stricken areas, we know and we see it. There's more detours than there are open doors to success. Any white right. person from the the most dingiest low to the dirt hillbilly in a trailer park to a fortune 500 successful caucasian man is going to be able to survive a police encounter they can have a physical altercation so it doesn't matter about etiquette or anything if they want to kill you they'll kill you you can be an intellectual you can you know be well read our, our black leaders were well read and educated they still killed all of them Thanks. cool hey so i got uh Kurt, what you got, Kurt? I want to chime in what the brother said. So I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that wealth does not keep you from not being discriminated against. But I don't, my own personal belief, I don't think that you will find a wealthy African-American man being killed at the hands of the police. And I'm going to tell you why. The wealth creates a degree of power. And people attack those that they feel like have no defense. So we go back and we look at the economic trajectory of most of the people who were, who were killed. They did not represent power. They did not represent influence. You're not going to see a guy get pulled over in a Range, in a Range Rover or a Rolls Royce or a Bentley get killed by the police. Now, he might get attacked. He may even get a fat ticket. But they're not going to kill him because there's a degree of power that's translated with a man with means. So these people that they attacked and killed, and like I said, that, that's not going to keep people from getting discriminated against. You may get a ticket bigger than you should have got, but your life is not going to be taken because your defense is your wealth. Money is a defense. Like I said, sure. that's a call, but it is a defense. So sure. I, I think it's a cool. part of a hey, defense. So let me uh let me let me take it. I got uh definitely just a part of the defense. Yeah, it's a part because Bill Cosby's in jail now. They just get that's, you a different yes, way. They just get you a different way. That was so, still a lynching over yeah. Yeah, and 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 the, and, and the fact of the matter right. is, and right. the fact of the matter is, your wealth can protect you at the moment. Once once it's mass genocide on lower income areas, the only niggas left are the wealthy ones. They ain't go, they're not going. They're not going to consider your wealth once you're the only ones left. That Bentley could be as nice as as it is. But when they kill everybody else off, that are all those people that are in the poverty stricken areas, they they're not going to make an exception. The hate is what drives it. Right now, what's buying time is that status and your wealth. Of course, I agree with that 100%. But it's simply a matter of time. Why are we doing this? Okay, time? So, right, so, 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 hold on. Let me, let me, let me get that. Hold up. Uh, D, I got you, man. Next, what you got, D? After this, uh, we're going to move to, we're going to move into a little bit, something, a little something different. We're going to shift speeds a little bit. D, what you got? Uh, if you want to, if you want to bring up a different topic or something, you can. I would just nah, I I go to you. Uh, I go to you, and then Kay, you'll be the last one on this topic. Go ahead, D. Uh, Tone says something that that made me think about something. That I don't know if that was. I'm not saying this was your, your. This is your idealism, but he says something about equality, and I just wanted to bring this point up. Right while we're talking about wealth, um, I saw a video of, and I'm not gonna remember who the brother is, but he had a. Uh, he, he had a flag behind him. He was talking about his, basically his question was, why are you asking somebody for something um, that you already know they're not going to give you, right? Um, and a lot of times I feel like when we see these peaceful protests, and this is not a shot at politics, because I think politics is important. But I think a lot of times when we see protests um, back to the king up until today, I think people go, people, I think people's purpose for protest, for protesting is to go to the government and ask them for something. 
Same reason why you go to the same reason why they go to this, they bring something up in the Senate or the judicial floor, the House Committee representatives or whatever, they bring they bring a bill forward because they're asking for something to be passed, right? And then they gotta vote on it. And depending on who controls that house or that Senate at the time and how many votes they get is gonna determine whether the person that brought the bill forward is gonna get what they asked for. Just no different than if you protest and people and they they feel like, okay, well, today we got 10,000 protesters outside, can we calm them down with a, we're gonna take care of you? Or are we gonna have to actually do something that they can see in order for them to quiet down or calm down or whatever, right? So you basically go on and ask them. And I think for, I personally think for too long, we've been asking as a people for equality. That's just my personal opinion. You know, it's not up for, it's not like if you wanna, you can agree to disagree, it's cool. But I just think as a people, we've been asking way far too long to treat us as equals. And like, personally, I'm, exhaust, I'm exhausted by the shit. I'm just gonna say shit. I'm exhausted by the shit, you know what I'm saying? By like, yo, can we just, can we just be equal? They've been saying no since 1760, I don't know, 15, when they, brought us here they didn't bring us here to be equal 1619 19. Yeah. they didn't bring us here to be equal they didn't write the laws for us to be equal it's 2020 and they still i personally could give a shit if they see me as equal or not right i'm gonna start at my i'm gonna start with my house right if i work my ass off right i got kids in my house i got a wife in my house i got i got a uh i got a uh, i got a uh a garden in the backyard. I got a car in the driveway that I want to keep. I work my ass off all my life to build this house up. And somebody comes to my door and says, I have this piece of paper that says this house or this car, or that garden or whatever it is no longer belongs to you and you have to go. And I say, I don't care what you say. And then they come back with the police or the sheriff or whoever it is to take my shit, right? I got two choices. I can go, well, that's the law. Let me give it up. If I don't give it up peacefully, they're gonna take it. They're gonna put me in jail. They're gonna find some loophole, some piece, of, some something to say you violated whatever, whatever. You going to jail? Your your wife is not without a husband. Your kids are not without a father. You're in prison, or you or you if you fight back, you shot. Or I can be prepared for that situation. I work my whole life for this shit. You're not taking it. I don't care what that piece of paper says. And if you want it, you're gonna have to come and take it by force, and you're gonna be met with force. I'm not asking for you to look at me as an equal or whatever. I'm telling you, I'm not taking it. Period. And I'm gonna teach That's what the white community would do. They listen. I don't know if y'all. I don't know if y'all. Um, I gotta find. I should have found this article. I didn't know this was gonna come up. But there was an article a few years back where there was a federal building. It wasn't even like a, a major building. It was like the federal building of out agriculture, or some shit like that, right? This was in the paper, and there was a. It, the building, it was a small building, right? A little operational building or something like that, but it was a federal building. And it sat on the property of somebody that owned like, you know, 50, 100 acres, whatever it was. And this land had been in his family for, 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 for generations, right? So they wanted to expand outside of where the building was at and it cut into the, into the people who owned it. It cut into their land. These are white people, all white people. The federal government tried to come they tried to expand the, you know, build a bigger parking lot. Some shit. It was, some, it was something small. It wasn't even that serious. The point is, the people that owned the land said, "Absolutely not. Hell no. You're not putting this on our property." And when those people came back with sheriffs, they were met with the the brothers and cousins and uncles that belonged to that family. They was met with assault rifles. Period. It was like, "Yo, this land has been in our family for generations. You're not taking it." Flat out. And, and, and the government was like, well, this is a government. And the story just walked, it just went away. They actually had a firefight. Like they actually, they actually held that, 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 uh, that little piece of property down and occupied that federal building that sat on their land. They occupied that building and did not let the people that, that uh, worked at that building, they didn't let them come to work that day. They was like, you're not coming to work no more. You're not taking this building. This building is not occupied by us. And they, they was at the door where they was at the fence at the whatever with assault rifles. They left those people alone. That's kind of like Waco. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, yeah, this, it's like this, Waco. Yeah, this was like, this was, it might've been 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, but that's fairly current. 
You know what I'm saying? And the government probably felt like, well, you know what? It's not, I don't know what they felt. I don't know if they felt like it wasn't that serious. I don't know if they felt like it wasn't worth the resources to send nobody in there to get hurt. It, this is Jed and, and Jim Bob and the good old boys, right? But they in their pickup trucks with rifles, like they're not taking our building. They're not taking our land. They're not building nothing over here because it's been in our, 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 our family too long. And they held it down and they kept it. We don't do that. We need to do that. They wasn't asking to be like, can you just treat us as equals and please let us keep half of the uh, land or, or, or give us a law that says we X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. I, I just think it's, I think it's time's up for that ideology, you know, for us to be trying to go to the, you know, there's nothing wrong with, like I said before, you know what I mean? We need all of those pieces. We all, I think we all agree that we need every piece of the puzzle. I just, I just, I just choose, I just choose, you know, my fight on the economic side as well as the security side, because you can have all the stuff you want, but if they feel like they got the power to take it and their intention is to come and take it, nothing's, they're gonna, they're, they're already, that's like somebody getting ready to break in your house. They've already decided they're gonna break in your house. They already know what you got in your house. They already decided, yo, Sunday night, eight o'clock, we gonna go in there and rob this house. If they've already made that decision up that they're coming in the house, they coming in the house. You just gonna have to deal yeah. with whatever happens after they come in there, right? But the other side is not contemplating: should we? Can we? Is it right? Is it moral? Is it not? They already this has already been programmed in their brains for the last four hundred years that they can take what they want. Period. Yeah, we right? just gonna lay down and, and we uh, just and accept we it. go to church and we pray and we protest peacefully. And they still lynching us. Right. Four people got hey, K, what you K, what you got? Um, okay, so Dewan, I, I I fully agree with you on on that on your perspective on that wholeheartedly, right? I think at this point we are for me. Um, I don't know how much time I have ahead of me, so I'm I'm rebellious with it. Okay, if you're not a felon and you can go get you some guns, go get you some guns. Learn how to shoot. Protect your home, because that's what they do. If they come kicking your door, you got that AR-15, you light they butt up, you know, you keep it moving, right? On top of that now, you remember that whole thing with Pac, when Pac was saying, you know, you're looking through the window and these white folks got a big a big buffet of food and you, you knock on the door and be like, let me in, let me in, and they still denying you. At mm -hmm. some point, when you get hungry enough, you kick in the door in. There ain't no Absolutely. more talking. We, we exactly. forget the talking. Talking is over. Okay? Exactly. I'm from Jamaica. I lived under poverty. Okay? I used to get up and run a hundred goats to the field every day before I went to school. Okay? These people don't owe me nothing. Right? We just got to take, we got to take what we have for ourselves. They're not going to give us nothing. We just got to take it. They will never, they will never respect us. They will never give us anything. So I, 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 so my whole stand will always be on economics, okay? Because I think that's the only way we hurt them or the only way we even compete. Look, I, I, I get everything else. I mean, I understand we don't want to play their game and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. But the only game that they know is control. And the biggest control for them is still economics. I don't care how you cut it. Every conversation we've had on this on this whole talk right now still point, points back to dollars. I don't care how you cut it. It still points back to dollars. It, it still points back to how much we control, how much we own, okay? How much we are willing to work together. The crabs in the barrel mentality, that's only for us. We too busy tearing each other down, okay? I don't know. If, I mean, listen, you have these, these Mexicans and Cubans, they come up, it'd be 50 in a house, 50 of them in one house. And of course, I'm being facetious. Okay, but it's a it's a bunch of them in one house, and they're taking their and they're pulling their dollars together. They get one family get a store, then then they pull their money together again, buy another family a store. Then same the same cycle. They just keep repeating the cycle. We don't do that. Now we need space. We need we need to flodge. We need to act like we got it going on. We need to buy the big thing, and we are a consumer mentality. Black people. Mm. That was That's programmed. That was programmed. Right, so, brother. That was programmed. So, we're programmed so, that so, way. Yeah. So cool. Uh, good point, K. Um, I want to be respectful every time. Everyone's time. We're probably going to try to wrap it up in about ten minutes or so, around nine. I definitely think the um, the mindset of 
uh, just our people in general. Obviously, it's something that's been programmed. That's a whole nother larger conversation to have about, you know, just deprogramming our people um, to actually think differently to become part of the solution more than we are of the problem. Um, to actually kind of segue from what Dewan was talking about, about, you know, getting to the point where we tired of asking. Okay, so the asking has actually come to a point where uh, 45 has signed an executive order. Um, and I wanna know uh, what you all think about that and where, what will happen uh, from there going forward with this kind of executive order that uh, he's put into place this time. Uh, who, wanna, who wanna go with that? What's the, I'm what's gonna go the to order? Remind order. me of the order that he what signed. Did he, what did he sign? He signed um he signed a police reform bill the other day. Yeah, he signed the uh the law enforcement and yeah. I can actually pull it up. It's the law enforcement. Give me a second. But it's the law Since you since law you're pulling it up, go ahead, Kurt. You you, you the go law ahead. Enforcement and, and, and community act. And what it basically did is um <clears throat> he put some reforms around some of the things actually we talked about on the last call which was um, now putting in the registry system. So if a, if a police officer gets so many complaints, then there's a course of action. He, uh, he allocated some funding for um, kind of the better performing police officers in terms of getting them better training. Uh, I'm actually pulling it up because I actually, I was actually on the call, not the call, excuse me, I was actually on the email list. So when it hit my phone, the other day here, right here, it's the executive order on safe policing for safe communities. And it, it, uh, it was an executive order, and it says under the order, the Attorney General will allocate certain grant funding to only those law enforcement agencies that meet high standards, including around use of force and de-escalation as credentialed by reputable independent bodies. It goes on to say that the order provides incentives for law enforcement agencies to use a nationwide database to track terminations, criminal convictions, civil judgments against law enforcement officers for excessive use of force, which will create accountability between agencies. The administration will prioritize training and other programs for police and social workers uh, responding to incidents involving the mentally ill, addicted, and homeless. President Trump is directing the administration to develop and propose new legislation to Congress to further the policies of the order and build community engagement and it goes on and provides some quotes to 2018 our police arrested nearly 12,000 people for murder and manslaughter 25,000 people for rape and nearly 1.5 million for assault the overwhelming majority of the law enforcement community bravely performed their duties with integrity and honor close ties between law enforcement and their communities are important for all president trump's order seeks to redouble our efforts as a nation to engage directly with our neighbors and secure lasting relationships and it goes on but that just kind of provides a little flavor then it goes on to talk about the first steps program and i don't know how much you don't know guys know about that but that's the program that has uh, freed or reduced the sentences of um it's reduced excessive sentences by about 70 months so it says the president brought together the president established the Presidential Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice, examining how to improve community relations between the public and law enforcement, and it quotes some of his some of his uh, some of his initiatives. All right, so um, so I'm gonna go to uh, I'm gonna go to Ralph. Ralph, what you what you what you think about that? Because you know I'm chopping at the bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's why I came to you, man. That's why I came to you. Let me tell you about this this executive order. It, it is literally a suggestion. If you read through it, it's suggestions. It's, it, what it did was it took a lot of the dissent decrees of Obama's administration, stuff that Eric Holder was trying to do through law and through dissent decrees, and pulled the teeth out of it. So all the punishment that go with it, if you notice, it says incentive to. It didn't say pull funding if you don't. So, and that, and that, that's the game that uh, that that forty five play. He play these games where he says, "I'm doing this stuff," and then and even with uh, <laughs> the, the the decreasing of of uh, time, I, I I like that. I agree. I, I admit I like that. But again, that's exactly what Eric Holder was doing. 
He was going through pulling, and this is federal, now, mind you, because uh, uh, 45 can only deal with federal. He can't deal with states. And so that's what, what, one, of the, one of the problems with it, why it needs to go to law. If you look at the, uh, the Democrats' bill, it will mirror a lot of what Trump signed as an executive order. Difference is the Democrats put teeth behind it. They put punishment behind it. They put requirements in it. And that's the difference. And so good a good gesture to try to get y'all a vote, <laughs> good gesture, but it needs to have teeth. Because if I as a dep police department decide, well, I don't care if I get the funding to do to keep track. I just won't keep track. It doesn't do any good. So it so needs you basically to saying So you basically saying, Ralph, it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors and it's still up to the local municipalities. Basically. Absolutely. And Thanks. the federal government didn't do its part and and one one in, uh, enforcing law. But if you're going to go with a dissent decree, put punishments in, in place. If you don't, we hold funding. They didn't, they're not doing that. That's exactly what Eric Holder wanted to do. All right. T, what you got? Uh, I think Ralph said, <laughs> I, I, I revert to Ralph, man. That, that That's his lane, bro. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, my, my mind's still on the last topic, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I agree with Ralph, you know what I'm saying, on that. I want you know to smoke in here. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, and unless, it, unless it's some, some, some consequences behind you not doing it, then it's just something to look good to try to get people's votes. You know what I'm saying? So I, I agree yeah. with him on that one, man. Right. So right. that's my politician advisor anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Can I piggyback real Can I piggyback real quick? Go ahead, uh, real, real, real quick. The first thing, the first thing I heard him say when he was reading that was, was uh, he said something to the point of like safe policing for safe communities. And I think what's really important to understand is the wording when they write when they're writing these bills and they're writing these suggestions or whatever they are bringing to to the people and bringing to the government you know to make it look and sound like it's something they're really doing for us it's a lot of communities that's not safe right so it could be like for the safe communities well, what if my community is not safe it doesn't apply to me you know what i'm saying if you look at if you look at the um constitution there was a lot of wording in the constitution that does not apply to us at all. But people, but we we still catch ourselves on the side of the road or whatever, going like, it's my constitutional right, this, down the third. It's not really your constitutional right because the constitution really don't apply to you because they wasn't talking about you when they wrote it. Just like when they say to you, when just just like this this, this new bill that's in place, I, I think a lot of times it's I, I think it's important that we read the wording. And like, well, who exactly are you talking to? Because a lot of they might not be specific. They might just be like, we just gonna say it like this. Well, I was having that conversation the other day with somebody like, yeah, well, when they said that, who were they talking about? Or what did they really mean when they said what they said? They didn't really, you, they, you use a blanket statement, you know, like police in the safe communities, we all know all our communities are not safe. Yeah. Right? I had that conversation. Uh, I had that conversation uh, last week. There was a um, there was a meeting uh, between it was a, it was a community meeting um, about just racial relationships in general, and uh, you know it was it was some, it was some white people in there, and you know it was like uh, you know trying to I guess get some sort of understanding about race relations in this country and the relations between police officers and uh, black men and women and things of that nature. And I had to remind these people that, because this was in, this was in Peachtree City. So for all of you that are in Georgia, you know about Peachtree City. Peachtree City is like the golf cart community, probably about 75, 80% white people. So their policing is different. Um, so like to what Dewan was saying, um, when it, with respect to safe communities, uh, and, and the wording, I had to kind of like remind them, like, 
you guys are sitting here talking about police relations, but police relations in Peachtree City is a hundred times different than police relations in the hood, you know, where I come from, where, where right. in College Park. <laughs> you know, it's just a whole totally different experience. So it's it's nice to sit up here and talk about, you know, safe policing and, and say that, oh, well, our municipality hasn't had any uh, police brutality incidents and things of that nature, but they wouldn't. It's 80% white. Uh, why would they have, would, why would they ever have uh, a police brutality incident like that? Um, so right. it's nine o'clock. Drees, you extra late, but you still my, you still my guy. <laughs> bro, listen, man. First of all, I appreciate the invite, man. I appreciate y'all allowing me to break bread with y'all. I was hanging with the fam, and I just got the the uh, the invitation earlier, like a couple hours ago. So I, I tried my best to get on when I could, man. I apologize, but I appreciate good, the man. opportunity to be here, though, for sure. All good, man. Say something real quick, man, about the, we kind of just talking about the climate. I'm going to give you a word. Uh, uh, Chris Davis, I want to go to you. And then Jose, you ain't had much. I'm going to give you the last word, my bro. Go ahead, Dre. So, so I'm originally from New York. Um, I'm, you know, uh, me and Tori, we from the same, you know, we from the same hood, basically. And, um, you know, moved down here 2007. Obviously, Georgia is completely different from New York, completely different. And um, I think, you know, our view is a little, a little different because growing up, you know, in Syracuse, New York, you really just kind of stuck to your, to your hood or where you were from. You didn't really venture much outside of that or, or anything like that. And uh, when I moved here, you know, uh, a little different, you know, uh, Atlanta, you go around a lot more, experience different areas and, 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 and neighborhoods and things like that. And moving down here was really the first time I encountered uh, the Southern culture of, you know, how <laughs> black people are viewed, you know, from white people. And it's funny because um, I actually, so I have a friend and she is from London. And uh, I find myself all the time having to explain to her, she's black, by the way, she's black and she's from London but she's never really experienced what it is to be black in America, which is something completely different, I think. So um, her mindset is a, little, is a little naive, I guess, in terms of how she views this whole situation over here. She's a believer. She, um, and, and when I say she's a believer, she's, she, is, she is for Christ. And she thinks that everything can be prayed away. And that's true in, in, you know, in, some, in some aspects. But at the same time, the Bible also says faith without works is dead. So you can't just sit home and, 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 and pray to God and tell him, um, you know, change the heart of this man over here and expect that heart to be changed in order for that to happen. That man has to literally be in touch with the kingdom in order for change to happen. But what I try to get her to understand is this is a situation that has been going on for years. So this is not a situation to where you can just sit back and just hope that the kingdom resources will just change a heritage that has been present since black people first stepped foot on America. So I know I'm kind of rambling or, or, or not, or, you know, uh, I'm kind of rambling a bunch here, but I, I just want to share this one last thing. I was yeah, on a call for free. work. My bad. I was on a call <laughs> for work. It, listen, we get a lot of, we get a lot of people who, who feel like, our grievances that we're going through right now or that we're expressing are unwarranted. They don't think racism, racism exists here in the United States of America. And um, it was funny because my friend from London, she was on the phone with me as I was making a phone call. And uh, I'm in real estate, by the way, guys. So I was making a real estate phone call, seeing if somebody wanted to sell their house. And I got the person's voicemail. It was a lady and she happened to be white. And Somehow, some way, our lines crossed, and I got her. She was on the phone talking to somebody else who happened to be white. I know you guys probably experienced a crossing of lines before, and I I heard her conversation for maybe about three four minutes of it, explaining to her friend how black people were what's wrong with America, 
how all lives matter, how, you know, black people basically destroyed Atlanta and all this other stuff. And it was an eye opening experience for her because not only did not only did what I said resonate, but she heard it herself. So my thing is, I'm just here for the change, man. In any way that I can be a tool and an instrument to, to see change, I'm all about it, man. Where right, else did you grow up? Hey, hey, Chris, Chris Davis, let's go. Hey, man, I just want to say is, I know I've been kind of quiet, but I just really just, just love observing and, and like listening to a whole bunch of educated black men um, you know, I work at a university, so it's not too many of us like this to like even make vent to. So I just love listening to you guys uh, speak. Um, as far as everything going on right now for me, you know, honestly, I'm I'm tired. I'm tired. Um, I'm I'm tired of having to explain to people who, to ignorant people who don't want to learn. Um, I'm tired of. It's to the point where I live. I live in Syracuse, and I'm. I know somebody had mentioned by how like. You know, in Syracuse, you kind of stay in your, you stay, you grew up in the hood, you stay in that hood. That's kind of how I am. Um, but it's crazy how I feel right now. It's like, we're going through so much crime right now, but it's like, I still feel comfortable being around that than I do if I, if I get pulled over by like two cops. Like, that's where I'm at right now. Um, but like, like D said, I'm just here for the change. I'm here to be a part part of the change, so whatever I got to do. Um, like right now, I always have conversations with my students, like all the time. Um, you know, I talk about like, when I get pulled over, all the things I have to do, which I shouldn't have to do, but I have to do it. I have to take, take my keys out of the ignition, put it on a dashboard, put the wallet on the dashboard, put uh, my window down just a little bit so you know I'm not grabbing something. When I put, roll my windows down, I got to do all that stuff. Just to make sure I get home at night, you know? Um, but like I said, guys, I just love to be here. love listening to you guys. You all made a lot of great points. And I'm just here for the change. So whatever we have to do, whatever I have to do, I'm with it. Cool. Thanks, Neff. Jose, last word. What's up, homie? Look, real talk, I'm part of the minority. And when I say that, I've been shaking up a couple of calls recently within the last week. I've been part of the minority. Why I say that? Because actually I've been in a lot of situations with cops. And they were beyond pleasant. Sound crazy. It sounds crazy. And do I know what's going on? Yeah. But reason why I say that is because I always break it down. Me being a, a branding coach, I'm always talking about three things: perspective, opinion, and narrative. I can have a set of twins, right? Grow up in the same house, same family, eat the same time, watch the same things on TV, do the same sports or what have you, yet they can have two different perspectives, opinions. And narratives and what I see on social media or what I see on media in general is people trying to plant seeds into people who are not fertile. They're trying to, yo, you need to understand where I'm coming from. You need to understand where I'm coming from. And again, if I was a white male saying that for that for first thing, like, yo, I'm in the minority and I had pleasant experiences. They'd be like, man, if you don't get your white off of here. But because I am a dark skinned male, they're like, what? And I'm gonna be honest with you. Quick thing in regards to the story, I'm going to make long story less long. Both situations, I'm talking about belligerent drunk. One of them I'm coming straight from the studio. Another one I'm coming from the club with genuine fry. Now, mind you, first time coming from the studio, pulled me over two white cops. And he was like, can we check the car? I looked around, I'm like, ain't nobody coming down this highway? Yeah, because y'all could hit me up. Now, mind you, got a bottle of Hennessy in the back seat. Blistered, blistered off the drink. He made me stand on the side. I'm talking to his partner. He literally go through the stuff. He opened up the trunk, woo, 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 move the Hennessy bottle out the way. He's like, all right, shook my hand. And did it. Okay, cool. Another time, I'm talking about super fried, coming from the truck, I mean, from the club, dealing with the chicks and everything like that, to the point where he, he was like, all right, we're going to do the sobriety test. Did the little, y'all know the hand, the nose thing, woo, 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 stand on one foot. And you know, man, I'm a jokester. So I say, yo, make your foot, stand on your foot too at the same time. He fell over before I did, and he looked in my eyes with the flashlight, say, look like you just on the early onset of being drunk. You have a nice day. I'm talking about not even a warning. I pulled up in my house. I fell out in my lawn. Again, we're having great situations. Even the one time with a young lady where we had to get detained, I wasn't in handcuffs. Like, because I didn't do anything wrong, but he they had to do the same thing. I didn't put me in handcuffs just in the back of the, of the uh, squad car. Boom. But I say all that to say because it was three things that really 
that really, really hammered in, not just in regards to perspective, opinion, and narrative. It was first off, yo, we got to know our true authentic self. And when I say knowing our true authentic self, first and foremost, I know what I look like. I know potentially I could come off as a threat. It's even to the point where, like my man said, I want to get home. So the first thing when I pull over with the cop, I'm putting all the windows down, sunroof open, I don't care if it's dark, and I'm putting all the lights on, cool. I might even sometimes put the glasses on. I put the glasses on, pull them drinks out, and a lot of people would hit me with, like, Jose, why you got to do all that? And I'm like, yeah, I don't show up like that at church. If I was in a nine-to-five space, I'm not going to show up in an interview like that. I'm still me, right? So why wouldn't I do that if I'm trying to get home? So knowing your true authentic self, knowing what you might represent at that space and at that time. Uh, the, le- the number number two thing was, yo, what's your level of respect? And I know one of y'all said it in regards to the respect aspect. And it's the same thing that I tell my sons. First and foremost, I teach them, y'all, you're going to be gentlemen all the time. I was in a retail space. I just shook hands with 70,000 people, and I treated all of them with respect. Right? So there's nothing different that I would do with a cop. It's nothing to do with it. If I was meeting one of y'all at the same time, like, it's a high level of respect. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to give that. And so at that, so it's innate. So when I'm pulling over, when I'm getting with a cop, there's, like I said, that level of respect of the good. And the last thing was, um, what's your level of accountability? So when I say as far as the level of accountability, real talk, if I was detained or if anything happened, I was wrong in all those situations. We get into places, and I'm not saying us here, but it's been times when we've been in spaces where maybe our back is against the wall with a cop. And the thing about it, we were in the wrong. I know I was. I know I should not have been drinking and driving. I know uh, all these specific uh, things that I did, I literally was, should not have been. I could have got somebody killed on myself. So what is that? level of accountability because it is a lot of times where we do want to blame it on race, but I was drinking and driving. Damn Maybe it, man. You know hey, listen, listen, listen. Jose, yeah. I'm glad you had the last word, my brother. You hear me? Yeah. I'm, I'm Listen, bro, I'm so appreciative of that because you just made it clear. It ain't just sometimes about the police. We can't blame the police all the time. Yeah. Sometimes we have to take responsibility. We Sometimes we have to be accountable for that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? My mom used to always say, this is the bed you made, you got laying it. And so yeah. the reason why I say that, because again, I'm coming from a different perspective. I'm a black, dark-skinned male who had nothing but pleasant. And I thank God for it, because anything could happen. But at the same time, nothing but, in my 39 years on this earth, but good experiences. And again, when we're going back to perspective, opinion, and narrative. We cannot fall people who don't understand. I understand because I've seen it. I've seen individuals who look like me but if i didn't see anybody who did not look like me my perspective and my narrative and my opinion would be different than every person on him you know what i'm saying the reason why and i actually i was on the call this weekend and the first thing i say is yo i'll be i had this toothache and this toothache man for real for real it probably feel worse than childbirth i know it feels worse than childbirth the women went crazy they was like ah but then i said all right cool what if i was a woman who had five kids and they said that same thing now, again, the perspective has switched. The opinion has switched, as well as the narrative. And I, the way I always end off all my stuff, I'll be like, yo, your personal brand or your social media is the only media that you control. And I always say, how are you controlling the narrative? So even with us, even with this calling, even with our kids and everything that we do, how are we controlling the narrative? So I appreciate you, Tori, for doing this. Dog, you know what I'm saying? I apologize for missing the first one. But again, how are we controlling? the narrative out here now. I salute you. All good. Jose, great final word, man. So um, I'm going to say this. Uh, Everybody on here is relevant. Everybody's opinion on here is important. Uh, Everybody is necessary for us to change moving forward, right? I think the purpose of this uh, type of call is really to get the understanding that yeah k might feel some way about economics but there's somebody else on this call that feels the same way about economics so why not k and this other person work together because they strong in economics there's another person on this call or may not be on this call right now who is strong and militant and they feel like let's strap up we need to be the protectors and provide security so I say, hey, you get with du- you get with Dewan because y'all strong on security. You know what I'm saying? We need those people in place. 
and then there may there may be some other cats who are like uh norwood and like kurt who are heavy into politics and they got the brains and they got the strategy and they know how to maneuver and get us in the places where we need to be of power you know what i'm saying so we can really really try to infiltrate where we need to be at so i say hey yo y'all two get together and y'all form that you know and as we all put these things together and form like voltron you know uh i used to love the voltron cartoon and the little cats they wasn't nothing but when they got together like voltron it wasn't nothing nobody could do you know what i'm saying so i i thought it was important to have this because you know what i'm saying like in our immediate circles we might not have people that agree wholeheartedly with how we think, but that's not to say that the way that we think is irrelevant. You know what I'm saying? So if we mix the networks together, you know, and we might be able to find other people that, yo, I feel exactly the same way you feel. Let's try to build that. You know what I'm saying? Then that's when you start to put these pieces together and, you know, we start to form like Volt like Voltron, the, the way we, really really need to do it um so just to reiterate you know what i'm saying the economics is important the politics is important the militia is important you know all of those things is important for us to move um as a unit um and one thing that i hate to see on social media uh like kind of what jose was saying you can't go on social media. I mean, you can, but it's not productive to go on social media and tell other people that their point is not valid. That's not doing anything. Everybody's point is valid. Just because they don't agree with your point don't mean it's not valid. You know, and I try to do my best when I'm on there just to kind of put the energy out there to people that, yo, it's okay to disagree. You know, we're not going to see eye to eye. That's perspective, like, like Jose was saying. Perspective and the way that the narrative is and personal experience all influences the way that people think you know what i'm saying but just imagine if this call had you know a thousand people on it or a hundred people on it or 500 people how many people you think would agree with t and his views you know you might get five or ten people on that 100 people that agree with t on his views and what he thinks and boom you got a little section right there of people who can move in that direction and make that thing happen. Or somebody that agree with Tone and Tone and that group of 10 to 15 people could move in that direction. Um, so that's the point of this call. Um, I appreciate all you homies for coming on and talking about this. Uh, it's very, very important. We need to continue to move forward. Uh, I may continue to just keep having them just the sharp and iron, man. Like, great call. Iron, iron so, sharp as iron, man. So, and Tori. I hate to, um, I hate to just keep. Uh, one of the things that I believe is that, um, Chris Davis, like you work with the youth. Um, so even though you still you 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 in Syracuse, which is a small town, but you on the front line with the youth and those are the people that really need to know, like they might get on this call and have no idea what we talking about, you know, cause they might not be tapped in. So for you to be here and to take everything that you might've absorbed today and bring it back to the youth, that's impactful right there in itself. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I definitely appreciate everybody for coming on, man. We all important, man. I love y'all all as my brothers and uh you know I, I try to keep it you know 1000 with everybody that I come in contact with man especially if I rock with you and you're a stand up guy man um so can I chime in one second go ahead Tom. um the whole, to Jose's point I think it was extremely valid um but I, I think even in that that mindset and that approach I think it's a uh, case by case situation. Um, I was raised by my parents the same exact way. Um, and I was raised by Tori from age 15 on up to move and think exactly the same exact way. I, I consider him a father figure and you know, my father definitely. Um, but I've definitely had encounters where I went through everything that I was taught 
Um, and I have some quote unquote pleasant experiences, but I've also had situations where I was detained even though I was compliant, respectful and did everything. And one situation specifically in Rochester, New York, where I was detained and put in the back of a squad car at three in the morning um, with my younger cousin. And I know for a fact if the young lady I, I had with me didn't make mention of the Black Lives Matter situations going on and, and Black people being slain. Um, and I think it was around 2015. I know for a fact I would have been in harm's way because the energy that was coming from the officers wasn't pleasant, wasn't inviting at all. So I think to move with that mindset is sort of the issue in a sense because there's no Caucasian individual that has to move thinking that way. We grow up in our houses thinking and being taught to move in a certain way, which is what it is. You know, we didn't come through Ellis Island. We're not immigrants. We were brought here and I, I feel as if they see us as advanced educated pets. That's just the way it is. So, you know, I, I think that this call was amazing and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with all of you um, brilliant educated brothers. Um, and thank you again to Tori for making this space. All right, so, absolutely. So, hey, so, Tori. So, yo, Tori. What? Yo, yo, yo. All right, let me, can I just, just one last thing for me on my part and I'm done. Um, I, I get it on everything. That's fine. Uh, you know, we, we, we still at some point can't continue to keep, to be, to be victims because at some point that's all we, <laughs> you know, perpetuating the same thing as being victims, right? So we got to take the reins and control some of our destiny. Now, with that being said, also, if you don't have a small business, get a small business right now. Okay. The government is still giving out EIDL loans. Okay, so yes, I'm still on the economic thing now. So get on there, get 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 apply for that loan, man. Apply for that grant. Okay, go on EIDL. I don't care how much you're gonna get, you're gonna get something, right? Yeah, yeah, um, proving it too. yeah and if you don't, <laughs> if you don't, and if you don't have a business, go ahead and start one now. You don't have to get an LLC, you can do a, a sole proprietor, okay, and still get the bread. Okay, but of course you want to probably get it legitimized at some point, depending on on the kind of what, what kind of business it is. You know what I'm saying? But but there's 475 tax codes for for businesses. Okay, there's only like 50 something for the for the regular employee. That means businesses are made to th to thrive. Okay, this system, this capitalistic system, was based on businesses and business ownership. How you think a company like Amazon could not pay any taxes? You know what I'm saying? Multi-billion dollar company. Don't pay any taxes. They write everything off. We have to have that same mindset. So go on e. I go on that SBA um, website, and if you if you drop Uber, fill out for that loan for that grant. That's yeah, all I have to say. Absolutely. Hey, Thanks. so definitely can, can, definitely do can, that. Uh, you just gotta. You, yeah, you just gotta have a get your business account and uh, file for that. That's K, the economic guy. <laughs> one, one, one last point, and then I'm gonna be out. This is a sidestep. So, for the last couple of weeks, my political organizing brain has been working. So, I've really been focused on a, a two pronged system one, to aggregate black political power on the very local level, to the county level, to the federal level that could be implemented and looked at, whether you're in California or Georgia or anywhere in the country. And then also, since we're talking about all the different facets that have to work together to just give black people an even advantage there is a political system that I think that could work if we implement uh, a, a seven branch council around the ideas of unity, uh, self-determination, cooperative economics, collective work and responsibility, um, creativity, purpose, and faith. And, and I'm down to talk about it more and, and anybody that's willing to, in their own community, just get out there, right? Change starts with self, it starts with family, and then it goes out into the community. Before you change the world and the country, you gotta change, you gotta change yourself, you gotta talk Facts. to your family, and you gotta go Facts. out there into your community. So Facts. my number is here. I, I'm just interested in what counties y'all represent, and then from there, we can start looking at the numbers because black people do have power. Uh, Jeff Bezos only makes up 16% of his board, but he speaks for it. So as a result, even if we only make 10, 20 30 percent of our community if we come together and we fund ourselves and we look at how all the needs of our community across the board we can really implement real change so facts facts all right i don't know if, yeah. you, I know if, you, if you're going to put together a, a um 
some sort of a contact sheet for everybody that's on the call. So yeah, I throw I throw together I throw together something, man. So we, ha we actually been we actually been sharing we actually been sharing contact in the text. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, drop, if you look in the if, if you look in the chat, uh, okay, everybody's been throwing their information in there. Obviously, y'all yeah, all already yeah, got good. my information. Yeah, yeah, uh, last good. thing, I, I just want to uh, real one, quick say two phrases I just want to embed in your brain real quick. Learn how to trade Forex, go to range and learn how to shoot. Learn how to train Forex, go to range and learn how to shoot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like that. I like that dude right there, man. Yeah. Learn hey, how to, hey, Duwan. Duwan, hey, I'm going to reach out to tell, you, bro. Hey, I didn't want to tell y'all, man. I'm going to reach out to Duwan. You know, I don't... Man, hey, you man, know. Go, ahead, go, ahead and, go ahead and get my info, man, and drop yours. We're chat. Yeah. Everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, firearm laws is a little different, so I don't know. Uh, get them in, get them anyway. Get them anyway. Go to the drink. Learn how to shoot. Get Learn how to shoot. Get, it, <laughs> get it anyway. Um, hey, 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 no sideways shooting, man. Ain't no, ain't no moving. <laughs> <shooting. laughs> <laughs> uh, no, go, go, actually, actually, get it, shoot, a, actually, actually, go to, actually, go to the range, man. They got instructors there that actually show you exactly what you need to do. Hey, you know what? They closed the range near, but they closed the range by my house. So oh, they it? wasn't opening. They're not opening it back up uh, because, for one, uh, obviously the temperature and the climate in the country right now, gun sales has gone up by some astronomical number. Man, like eight hundred percent, right? Eight hundred percent, something like that. <laughs> I went to the store to get some rounds. And you can't find the rounds anywhere, pretty much. Yo, Bass, Bass Pro Shop look like a ghost town. I've, yeah. never, seen that. I've uh, never seen it in my life. They don't have nothing in the show. Nothing. Yeah, so the shelves is empty when it comes to rounds, but uh, I got to connect, so if anybody needs to connect. All right, that's no cool. doubt. Obviously, no doubt. No obviously doubt. here in Georgia. Um, one last thing I'll say, because uh, <laughs> I wanted to kind of bring it up when Jose was talking about, you know, uh, interaction with police officers. I feel like everybody pretty much on this call has probably had a really negative, not even just one, maybe several negative interactions with police officers. I can remember being in uh, Harlem one time uh, uptown on, uh, on the block, uh, notoriously 145th and Broadway or 145th and St. Nicholas Avenue um pretty much notorious for just crack sales at the time this was in mid to early 2000s and we weren't really doing anything man we was actually stopping at the store and when i tell you uh three vans pulled up one pulled up in front of us and they boxed us in because we was parked on the side of the street one van pulled up in front, one pulled up on the side, and one pulled up behind us. And probably about, I say maybe seven to ten officers hopped out, um, and they didn't even have they didn't have their Glocks, man. They had the they had the heavy joints, you know. They had them assault rifles drawn ready, and um, you know that was an encounter, man. That. Uh, I don't know, man. It was it was eye opening, but to say the least, man. Probably it was a really life changing. Uh, I mean, I had I had had encounters like that. Uh, I hadn't had encounters like that before, but I've had negative encounters, but not to that magnitude. You know, where they hop out like SWAT. Um, so we've all had those negative encounters, man. And I think if anything, man, like. Just be smart and be safe. Everybody on here is different. And I think one thing that we can all agree on is that we don't want to die and we want to get home to our family. And we all smart individuals. 100%. And, you know, we all smart and we all may handle ourselves differently a little bit in those situations, but none of us on this call wants to be um, on the news. Um, talking about, you know, this cat lost his life. So peace and blessings to y'all, my brothers, my family, my nephews. I love y'all. I love salute y'all. 
Uh, everybody's information that shared it is in the little chat box. Uh, and we probably going to do this again, man. I'm going to just, we continue to break bread every few weeks, man, and get on yeah. and, you know, we network and see how, what's up with everybody. Uh, Dries, I got to get with you. I didn't know you was in real estate, bro. Uh, so I'm going to holler at you. Yes, sir. And, uh, man, I love y'all, man. I'm going to holler. Love y'all. Go Niners. Love y'all. Blessings. Later. Peace.